Well, good afternoon and welcome to another edition of our Lunch and Learn series. Uh, welcome to our in-house audience and our virtual audience. It's a pleasure to see you uh, uh, here today. Uh, we've got a great program for you today. Just a couple of notes about some things coming up. Uh, uh, spring break is just around the corner and we have huge plans for spring break. We're bringing in a, a world-class exhibit, uh, uh, it's, uh, five tractor trailer loads of, uh, of exhibits. Uh, they're building a geodesic dome behind the museum during spring break. Uh, and it'll be April 2nd through the 9th, all to do with the global water crisis. And the Global Water Center out of uh, Charleston, South Carolina, uh, is, uh, has traveled with this exhibit across the country, but they've always visited big parking lots of shopping malls. And I, when I caught up with them about a year ago at the uh, um, at Gwinnett, uh, the Mall of Georgia, uh, I said, well, why don't you partner with the Science Museum? They looked at me and said, well, we never thought of that. And so they had never heard of TELUS, and by, but they came to see us, and they were very impressed, and so we're very excited to have them. It's going to have uh, not only exhibits about uh, uh, where water comes from in the solar system, where water comes from on our planet, but how to supply cleaning, clean drinking water to every human being on the planet, which is the mission of their nonprofit the reason for their exhibit. Uh, and it's, it's really uh, very exciting. And for my staff that are out there, uh, you're all going to be trained in, in uh, the interactive exhibits uh, the afternoon of April 1st uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, get a preview of the exhibit and all the interactive activities that go with it for our young visitors. I see a few young visitors out there today, and they're going to have a good time with that. Well. Uh, today, we have the pleasure of having our, general, our own general science manager, Wendy Hayes, here. She's been on the staff here for eight years, and she really has been the creative force behind so many special programs here at the museum. Uh, she is uh, the mom for uh, uh, the uh, mad scientist uh, uh, program we, hear, we have here at the museum, and they, they play again soon by the way, with the opening of our material science, uh, rather for our uh, opening for our uh, GEARS exhibit in May. Uh, so that's going to be exciting. Uh, and uh, uh, Wendy's background, uh, she, she hails from New Jersey, and uh, she uh, uh, has her degree in uh, education and psychology from Dickerson College in Pennsylvania, and spent a while in her professional life uh, as uh, in telecommunications, and then she lucked up and got here to tell us with us. And so we're, we're very excited to have her here today to talk about material sciences. So let's have a big hand for Wendy. Thank you, thank you. Again, yes, I am Wendy Hayes, General Science Program Manager, and uh, I do head up the wonderful, wacky, mad scientists. Uh, we've done lots of uh, different programs. Uh, we're presented lots of uh, programs like black light theater. We've done chemical reactions. We've even made a homemade light bulb out of mason jar, uh, pencil graphite, and batteries. So uh, we really in, in enjoy that, or I enjoy that. But I am not a material scientist. Sorry. Uh, but I love things, all things science. Uh, I love trying to repurpose things. Um, seeing, you know, how things work and how we can use them in, in different applications. So when I found out about our new exhibit, uh, Superhero Materials, I was beyond excited. Uh, but I also thought, how is this going to work? Because you actually have to, you know, physically do all that. Um, but as things started getting delivered to our curatorial team, and they'd say, oh, look at this and look at this. And you go in and you see these wonderful uh, little samples of things. Uh, the excitement just kept building. So David asked me if I wanted to do the lunch and learn. I was like, yes, yes, I want to do this. I want to be involved in this. This is, you know, this was, this was great. Two days later, I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, what did I get myself into? I am not a material scientist. What am I going to talk about? I, can't, I don't know. I don't have that background or anything like that. Um, but again, I did remember that I loved 
you know, investigating things. With the mad scientists, we looked at different chemical reactions and things like that. Uh, so I thought, well, what if I gave a kid-friendly uh, preview of our exhibit uh, that is coming up? Uh, March 25th is the preview of our uh, superheroes material. You can uh, go onto our website to get tickets for the uh, preview opening at from 5.30 to 6.45. Uh, they are featuring Vanta Black. Has anybody ever heard of that? But it'd be the blackest of blacks. It's actually a coating of carbon tubes that absorbs 99.965% of light. Now, why is that important? Well, if you have a device that needs, that works best uh, with the absence of light, like telescopes or in the observatory, uh, it's, a, it's a great uh, material. We also will have uh, uh, air gel will be featured, which is an insulator and also used to protect uh, things from heat. It's uh, made of ceramic, but also mostly air. So uh, we'll have some different exhibits and you can uh, test that. Um, air gel is being used now like in coats and jackets to create uh, a nice warm insulation without all the bulk and heaviness. Uh, we're also featuring a polymer called D3O, which is used to absorb uh, impacts. If you've ever dropped your cell phone, you know that's important. And uh, we'll also have um, liquid crystal sheets, uh, which basically uh, changes color with the uh, temperature changes. I know you've seen some of those with, if you've ever seen the, uh, thermo uh, the temperature thermometers that you wear on your head or in fish tanks where it changes colors depending on the degrees. So those are just a little bit of things and hopefully spark your interest in coming to see our superhero uh, materials exhibit. But I'm also happy to report we will have an actual material scientist here. Uh, Dr. Mark Lasego, Associate Professor of Material Science and Engineering at Georgia Tech, will be our guest lecturer uh, following the preview at 7 p.m. He'll be here to discuss the science behind some of the materials that we use every day to enhance our lives. So mark your calendars next Friday, March 25th. And of course, as David said, while your calendars are open, go ahead and pencil in spring break. Um, they'll be joining us uh, Saturday, April 2nd through Sunday, April 10th. And it's a great way to promote awareness and encourage people uh, to learn about the uh, global crisis. So that's all happening. Please join us. Back to material science. Oh, there's my spring break one. All right, uh, so what is material science? Well, first, let's look at the first word, materials. So material is defined as a substance that is intended to be used for certain applications. Uh, the matter from um, which a thing is or can be made from. Look around you, you see lots of materials. Materials or uh, everything is made of something. We've got ceramics in here, we have metal, we have cloth, we have wood. Um, and generally they're character categorized into four main groups. We've got metals, polymers, ceramics, and composites. And some people put in semiconductors uh, in that as well. So uh, material science, also known as material science, materials science and engineering, um, combines the principles of engineering, physics, and mathematics and chemistry to solve the problems, uh, to improve performance, create something new. It involves discovering and um, designing these new materials or existing materials, analyzing their properties and structures. The uh, material scientists then research the connections between these structures and the properties, as well as the manufacturing, um, the performance, and real world applications. And material science um, and engineering it goes a broad range of applications. Basically, they have their hands in a lot of pots. Uh, as I said, engineering, um, engineers rely on material scientists to come up with the materials for safer cars or buildings. Uh, material sciences are used in uh, technology, in your computers and uh, more uh, efficient batteries um, in the medical field, such as medical devices or implants, 
um, treatment procedures, and uh, medicines. And material science is also very big in the renewable energy area. Um, this development of solar panels and other um, natural energy sources. And it's even used here in museums to help analyze and preserve artifacts and artwork. So with all of that, let's explore. On your tables, I have a little, um, little basket there. And uh, we've got a few fun things that we're going to explore. The first one is the fortune fish. That's in the little envelope here. So everybody gets one. You get to actually take this home with you today. Uh, in fact, on the back, I have a little label here that will help you uh, do some experimenting on your own once you get home. But uh, let's talk about these fortune fish. Now, with, before the label, it actually uh, gave a few things about it can predict your future, which is fun. That's kind of cool. Um, but let's look behind the science of this. Uh, so when you open it up, you're going to have a little red cellophane fish. And this material is actually a hygroscopic high polymer uh, made from sodium uh, poly acrylate. There we go. Whew, I got that out without stuttering. Uh, and actually, it is the same stuff that we use for uh, the fake snow or in diapers. Uh, so what this is, is it basically it grabs onto water molecules. So we have lots of sweat glands in our hand. If we were to put it in our hand, you can see that the fish starts to curl up. And why does this happen? Well, that's because this uh, cellophane actually has, uh, it doesn't absorb the water molecules, but it grabs hold of it. And when it grabs hold of it, it changes the shape of the molecule and thus changing the shape of our little cellophane here. Uh, what's happening is the moist end is uh, expanding where the dry end stays the same and it causes it to curl up. So I encourage you to go home and test this out on different surfaces. Uh, try it on a dry surface, try it on a different part of your body, maybe try it on your dog. Uh, see what happens uh, when you use these. The other thing that I have in the basket is, um, well, let's go back. Another material is a bimetal. Now, a bimetal, which I have an, uh, an example right here, is actually two thin, thin strips of different metals. And each one has a uh, different coefficient for thermal expansion. Basically, they um, uh, expand under different, they expand at different rates. So what we would do is, in your basket, this is actually another cool material. Uh, I do need these back, though. You can't, keep, you, you can't take these home. Uh, but inside is a super saturated uh, solution of uh, sodium acetate. And when triggered, it releases heat or it causes an exothermic reaction. Now, inside this solution, there's a little thin metal strip that if you carefully give it a bend, I'm trying to find mine in the light and it's not working, but if you give it a bend, it actually releases little tiny pieces of metal and it acts as the, uh, the site for crystallization to start. There it is. So as you can see, it starts to expand and heat up. Pretty cool, huh? Now, once it's fully uh, crystallized, it'll probably stay crystallized or hot for about two hours. And what's really neat about this particular one is uh, you can boil it and it'll go back to its uh, super saturated, so it's uh, super saturated state, so it is reusable. But what I'd like you to do is I have made, it's not a bimetal, it's actually bimaterial. And uh, the reason why I did it is because I want you guys to be able to duplicate this at home. All I used was some labels and some aluminum foil. And I just basically put my labels on here, cut them out, and created my bi-material. 
So if you take your bi material and you put the aluminum side down, watch what happens after just a few seconds. You can see that the end, oh, I want to keep that on there, uh, that the ends start to curl up. Are they curling up for you? Now, if you were to take it off in just a few moments, it's going to go back to its original state or go back flat. Now, with my bimetal, again, I've been resting it on some heat, and I can bend it. But as it cools down, it's going to go back to its original state, and you can see how it kind of, it's kind of a cool little thing there. And again, you can take these home if you'd like. You can put those back in the basket. Uh, but I encourage you to go ahead and try some on your own. There's uh, lots of other metals that you can try, maybe some aluminum with some copper. Um, but why is this important? What is this used for? So bimetals are actually used uh, in thermostats, in toasters, in ovens, and they help um, uh, measure and control the temperature. Now I've taken one of my little strips here so you can see how this works. Let me uh, change my perspective here. Oop. There we go. And so what I've done is I have, oh, it's been cooling and heating up. So I have my bimaterial here, and once it hits the metal, it closes that uh, circuit and turns the light bulb on. But then the light bulb starts to heat up that bimaterial, uh, and the edges start to curl up, and it breaks the circuit. This is uh, basically how our thermostats are working. Once it reaches a certain temperature, it cuts off or turns back on again, and you can see how it's kind of flowing back and forth. We also have a little bit of an air conditioner uh, hitting it too, so it's kind of fluctuating back and forth pretty quickly. Let's see if it will go back on again. But as I said, we have a little metal conductor. If I press it down, you can see how it goes on. There it goes. So anyway, there's our bi metal. Oh, there it goes. Okay. All right. So um, I want to not go there just yet. Um, how many of you, how many of younger ones, maybe some older ones, have uh, played Minecraft or have heard of Minecraft? Okay. Well, uh, the the uh, folks at uh, University of Texas, Dallas, actually saw the potential for the game Minecraft to help um, those approaching the college level to get them involved in studies of material science. So they have actually created a mod to, that goes with Minecraft to where uh, it's called Polycraft World to where um, they actually feature uh, petrochemical refining, harvesting of new ores, construction of polymers, uh, as well as um, uh, making plastics and specialty items, all kind of new stuff, and basically helps get um, the younger folk, or the older folks, uh, get in, into the world of material science. So, um, i getting close to our end, and um, I'd like to call this next section our uh, oops section. These are happy accidents that have occurred in material science or in during research, and um, I chose these for one, um, they're familiarity, I'm sure that a lot of you are uh, familiar with a lot of these, as well as their awesomeness. So I'm going to start off with my favorite one, matches. And you're saying, oh, what to do, matches, what's the big deal? Um, well, let's start from the beginning, well, the real beginning is fire. So once we had fire, we, there are so many applications for fire. 
Um, how do you make it? Rub two sticks together. Uh, we've had lenses or used the sun and lenses on uh, Tinder. We've used uh, flint and steel to create a spark. Um, but then they started to explore what happens in emergencies. Do you have enough time to create a new fire if you needed light right away? So they started using small sticks of pine wood and dipping them in sulfur and then touching them to a fire, which is pretty good, but still you needed to have that fire. They've also had uh, rolled paper or, straw, or um, straw, but of course, still having to set it uh, to an existing fire. So what could they come up with? What other ways could they um, make this easier or re readily accessible? So they found that um, phosphorus and sulfur were flammable. So in the uh, uh, 1680s, they actually uh, did a mixture of uh, potassium chlorate, sulfur, gum arabic, and sugar. And they would uh, put that on the end of a, a stick. And then they would dip it into a bottle of asbestos with sulfuric acid. And fire, how great is that? Um, so it, it worked. They didn't have to have an existing fire. And it was quite quick. It was also very expensive and extremely dangerous. So between the 1800s, it, within the 1800s, they started trying to come up with different ways and more economical ways to create uh, the match. And it was in 1827 when an English pharmacist, John Walker, he was stirring a pot of uh, antimony sulfide and potassium chloride, or chlorate, sorry, because uh, they were trying to develop a, a new chemical way of making a match and he noticed a dry lump at the end of his stick. So what do many people do if they find something stuck on the thing? They start to scrape it off. Well, he scraped it off and fire. So there started our first match um, by just scraping that off. So my next one, and I know this one was my favorite, but I'm also going in chronological order, is the x-ray machine or the x-ray. So back in 1875, a German physicist, physicist Wilhelm Röntgen, uh, was experimenting with cathode rays and to see if they could pass through glass. And uh, he had his tube. It was covered in black, um, heavy paper. And he was surprised to discover that there was a glow off to the side on a nearby screen. So he continued to uh, experiment with that and he would put different things in front of it. And he noticed that uh, most substances would leave, a, a, would leave a shadow of the solid objects. He then even tried to do it with his hand. And that uh, made him think. He uh, replaced the screen with a photographic plate, and he actually photographed his wife's hand. Of course, she looked at it and had said, I've seen my death. Uh, she wasn't too pleased with that. Now, he didn't know what these rays were, the radiation process was, so he actually called them X for unknown, which is where we get our X-rays. And uh, the X-rays became important uh, diagnostic tool, and it also paved the way for other safer uh, imaging technologies, such as uh, CTs and MRIs and ultrasounds. My next one is uh, penicillin. You guys all heard of the, the story behind penicillin. In uh, 1928, Sir Alexander Fleming um, discovered penicillin. He was not known for his neatness. Uh, he was kind of uh, described as disorderly in his work. He probably had a cube like mine. Um, but that actually worked to his advantage. After returning from a vacation after two weeks, he noticed mold growing on a culture plate of Staphylococcus bacteria that he had accidentally forgot to cover before he left. Uh, but he noted that the bacteria was not growing uh, uh, near the mold. So further investigation and isolating the mold uh, he realized that the fungus actually inhibited the growth. 
and in 1942, penicillin was mass produced as a medicine. My next one is super glue. You've all used super glue. Uh, the inventor, Dr. Harry Coover, uh, was actually trying to develop a clearer plastic for gun sites uh, during World War II. Uh, he was working with um, uh, cyanoacrylates, and he abandoned the project because it was just too sticky. He couldn't, you know, he didn't get it, um, it just didn't see the application for it. And then in 1951, they revisited it again, or they revisited using uh, cyanoacrylates while researching heat-resistant uh, polymers for jet canopies. Again, they saw that it was just too sticky, but this time they saw the relevance or the importance of having something like that. And so they created the superglue. Now, superglue actually requires water to activate it which is why uh, it, or it activates quickly because there's water vapor in the air. Also, remember our fortune fish that showed you how much moisture you had in your hands? You don't want to put uh, your super glue near your hands because it will cure instantly because of the moisture that you have in your hands. Silly putty. It's a fun one. Uh, Invented in 1943, I'm not going to say by who because that's still a, an argument between the, the two um, scientists, but both scientists were working independently uh, during World War II because they were trying to find a synthetic rubber. Uh, rubber was in shortage and they wanted a cheaper substitute. So they experimented with silicone oil and uh, boric acid. They actually poured or the boric acid into the silicone oil, and it resulted in a stretchy, soft mass that bounced when thrown onto a hard surface. Uh, it easily broke in, in half. Uh, if you hit it sharply enough, it would shatter. And if you left it on a smooth surface long enough, it would actually start to uh, melt and, and move away and could really copy some comics. Um, but unfortunately, it wasn't any of the properties that the military wanted, so it was abandoned. Until a few, day, a few years later, uh, one of the uh, partners of the scientists was using it for party tricks. He put it in a plastic egg and resold it as a toy and marketed it as a toy. So we have the silly putty. The next one, I know they use this uh, post-its in a lot of movies as a comedy, but in 1968, Dr. Spencer Silver was actually trying to develop a strong adhesive, but he wound up making a repositionable weak adhesive uh, that he kind of just strapped and put off to the side. But in 1974, a fellow scientist wanted a lightly adhesive bookmark that he could uh, use for his personal uh, journal, and that became the post-it note. So pretty cool for that. Now, my last one is not actually the material itself, but the process. Um, the material is uh, graphene, and it is, uh, and I believe we might, do we have some graphene in our thing? Maybe, yes, no, no. I, I don't remember, but anyway. Uh, it's the thinnest compound. Uh, it is one atom thick. It is one to 300 times stronger than steel. It's uh, one of the best conductors of heat at room temperature and the best conductor of electricity. It has so many applications, which I'll discuss later, but uh, making it was very um, time consuming and expensive. In fact, the fir um, when they first started making it, they actually used graphite and scotch tape and would just hit, uh, pull off the um, residue from the graphite and then put that down and use it again until they got it down to its thinnest form. Um, but of course, you can see how painstakingly the, uh, tedious that would be. Um, but there was a research team in Kansas City, uh, Kansas State University, and they were in the process of developing uh, 
and patenting a carbon soot aerosol gel. And what they found is when they were detonating it uh, to make the gel, that there was a residue inside. And when they researched the residue, they found out that it was graphene. And uh, they could actually produce it in massive quantities. So they're patenting not the graphene, but the actual manufacturing of the graphene. Now, why is this important? Because graphene has almost limitless applications. Uh, it is used in supercapacitors. It, could boost the, it boosts the capacity and longevity of batteries. It has a flexible nature uh, used in uh, touch panels and mobile devices. It could in the future be used to have uh, portable, foldable te uh, television sets. Um, let's see. It's uh, uh, extremely, it's transparent and it can, it's extremely durable, so you could put it into buildings and windows. Um, it is a great conductor for, as I said, electricity as well as sound and light, so telecommunications. It's a corrosive barrier. Um, they are starting to add it into paint. And with all of the other things that it does, you could actually have a supercar just by the paint. Um, and it's also being looked into as a replacement for Kevlar. So material science is a growing and distinct field of science. Scientists investigate the materials um, that are manufactured and perform and why they may fail. Uh, this past weekend, my son was practicing for his presentation for his recent research project. And after listening to it and listening to it, I asked, why did you choose this subject? It's already been researched and you said it was a good jumping off point for a, a new research project. And uh, he thought about it and he answered, he said, because just one deviation can change the whole result of a problem uh, and give new insight into additional possibilities. And I thought, good job. I'm so proud of him. Anyway, um, I uh, hope I inspired you uh, to have fun with science, to come out and see our upcoming exhibit. Uh, and to listen to our speaker. And um, also, uh, one last thing. Um, I want to actually give a huge shout out to our curatorial team. This exhibit is phenomenal. They did such a wonderful job. So thank you, Amy, Ryan, Rebecca, David, and Jay. Um, I hope you guys will be able to come out and see it. Our next Lunch and Learn is April 27th. We are featuring our own uh, TELUS educator, Katie Yeomans, as she dis uh, talks about our archaeology and history of Gotland, Sweden. So until then, have a wonderful afternoon, and thank you for joining us. Oh. <clears throat> well, thank you, Wendy. Uh, I know there's going to be some questions from the audience, so don't go away. And uh, I want to come over, and, and if you have a question, just raise your hand, and I'll be glad to uh, put the microphone to you so you can ask a question. There's a question over there. Miss <laughs> May. Hi, May. Hi, darling. My granddaughter would like to know what is in makeup. Ah, uh, lots of, well, just depends. Especially, uh, most, oh, a, mascara? especially the mascara, yes. That I don't know. I don't wear makeup, but uh, <laughs> I do know there's a lot of minerals that go into, into makeup. Um, but that's a great question, and maybe uh, Dr. Lasego will have that answer. Um, but I don't know, but I could research that. I'll get back with you. I'll get back there's with actually you. There's actually an exhibit back in our uh, mineral gallery that has a, a thing of household items that has makeup in it. And says which mineral doesn't have mascara. Doesn't okay. yes, I was just gonna say okay. I know the other ones, but I don't know mascara. So I saw a hand go up over here. Hello. How do you make the earth? How do I make a the earth? The earth. <laughs> Whew. I I don't know. I'm still working on that one. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Questions over here? Any, any riveting questions over here? You're all looking up questions, I'm sure. Maybe. Maybe. No. Questions? Questions? Nothing over here? Oh, oh uh, Mallory says that fish scales are in mascara. Fish scales. Oh, yeah. okay. Wow. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Just to give scale to the Well, questions. again, I just hope, uh, you know, that it inspired you into think of questions and bring them next Friday. Uh, where you can ask a true material scientist. All right. Any, any other questions from our audience? Okay, well, thank you, Miss Wendy. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.